Welcome to the Exponential Minds Podcast. The research, development, launch, and growth of new technologies is creating incredible momentum in the modern world. Join futurist Nicholas Badminton as he talks with the innovators and the exponential minds that are tackling some of the biggest problems and creating solutions that are propelling humanity to the next level. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Exponential Minds podcast. My name is Nicholas Badminton. I'm a futurist. I help my clients look out 5, 10, 20 years into the future so we can create positive and equitable worlds. And today I'm incredibly excited to chat to uh, Pia Bulaka, who's been working for the Criminal Sanctions Agency in Finland since 2012 and started as a prison psychologist and then moved into central administration where she worked as a senior specialist responsible for rehabilitative services including program work family work and psychological and spiritual services in prisons uh, back in 2018 she was appointed the project manager of the the smart prison project and we're going to talk a little bit about that today her current post includes developing digital services for rehabilitative uh, purposes and leading the implementation of the smart prison system she trained as a forensic psychologist and works also as a private psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist as well. She's done further studies in artificial intelligence and digitalization for the purposes of the current Smart Prison Project. And Pia, it's absolutely fantastic to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Great. And um, so let's talk a little bit about your background uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and how you came to be involved in, in what you're doing today. How did you become involved in, you know, the fields of forensic psychology, psychotherapy? And then how did, uh, how did that sort of turn towards, you know, the criminal sanctions and the rehabilitative uh, services system? Okay, to begin from from my early years, I think I was always interested in in how the human mind works and and especially why why people behave the way they behave, and also kind of the dark side of the human behavior. And uh, of course, in high school, uh, I, I already studied psychology, and then later on went to University of Helsinki to study psychology. And then there we had a course in uh, criminal psychology, and that was kind of a turning point in in my in my life. I realized that this is the special field where I want to work, and um, I got a chance to do my thesis on offender profiling which is uh, recognizing what type of criminals do certain type of crimes. And, and after that, uh, there became a possibility to work as a, as a prison psychologist. So I went for that and I was in the field for about uh, 10 years, uh, eight years in prison work, and then, <clears throat> then a couple of years in forensic psychiatric unit also. Yeah. And... Um, and that's that's how my career uh, proceeded. And uh, a couple of years ago, then I uh, I got the chance to work as a specialist in the in the central administration. And uh, then came this interesting project that was the that was the next step towards uh, digital practices in forensics. So it, it's interesting because it seems that uh, Finland's had quite a progressive. Uh, prison system for for a large number of years, like decades, and they've been yeah. slowly changing philosophies um, to to the prison system as well. You know, ha, um, I mean, what does what did that look like over the years, and how things have changed, and how did that end up in a point where there is this smart prison project? I think uh, in Finland we have believed uh, for a long time uh, that if we want to be able to really uh, have an effect on recidivism. We have to have very rehabilitative practices uh, and premises for prisoners. And that's why we developed already decades ago the so-called open prison system. So we have the so-called closed prisons, but we also have open prisons. And it's the idea that for, for prisoners who have low risk on recidivism, recidivism, they go immediately to open prison so that they can continue working and studying as much as possible and, uh, and, and to have a re rehab, that the prison time works as a rehab. 
And if you have a higher risk of reoffending, then you first go to a closed prison to serve your sentence. If you proceed well, if you follow your sentence plan, you participate in rehabilitative programs and you can show that you have progressed with your behavior and, um, and you have um, handled your problems and went through your crime and, and the reasons behind that, then you have the possibility for the end of the sentence to go to open prison. And, and continue there. So it's a kind of step-by-step step going further to the uh, release. So uh, not directly from very closed settings because this is a risk uh, for recidivism, but, but first to open prison to kind of um, uh, train for the future uh, release in more open settings. And that has been uh, a very, um, good idea from the Finnish uh, Criminal Sanctions Agency to have this kind of system for prisoners. What, what have you learned? So the low risk, the low risk uh, prison population, high risk prison population, and kind of understand uh, the division between the, what have been the bigger, biggest lessons that you've learned from, from both of those groups and how, the, how has that sort of fed into sort of this, this, this open prison uh, sort of philosophy in Finland? Mm. If I think about the, the so-called low-risk offenders, not necessarily do I mean that they wouldn't uh, do another crime, but their crimes are different. They are usually uh, very marginalized uh, people already when they come to prison. They have mental health problems and uh, substance abuse problems. So they are more like, uh, how would I say, sick they are not bad people right, but they're right. sick people so th they need treatment uh, then if you think about the high risk offenders these are usually offenders that have more severe personality disorder problems and uh, um, criminal thinking uh, they they are more antisocial some even have psychopathic threats and usually their crimes are serious violence or or even homicides murders so um, what I've learned is that different prisoners need different kind of rehabilitation if you want to have an effect on them. They are all individuals. They, of course, they also have some common characteristics. You can kind of see that we have different kind of segments of prisoners or groups of prisoners with different needs and different risks. And that's why we have to have different ways of rehabilitating them. Yeah, so, so this is the lesson learned. <laughs> the lesson, yeah, yeah. I mean, people are different, and oftentimes prison systems are. Everyone goes into the system, and sometimes these low-risk uh, offenders can actually be, you know, their minds can be can be influenced by the the hardened criminals in a way, right? Exactly. So if that happens, that low-risk and high-risk prisoners are in the same settings, uh, the the high-risk ones will kind of a. Uh, teach lower risk individuals in the worst case scenario. So they, they got worse, they will get worse in uh, among the high risk prisoners. So that's, that's a risk too. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the smart prison project has sort of evolved over the last couple of years and how it works and, and, and maybe some sort of success stories from within it? Uh, in our field, there has been for, for quite some years a trend towards digitalization. So like many schools and hospitals and other institutions in the society have already digitalized. They have digital uh, client services. Prisons uh, are lacking a little bit behind, but, but we are coming. So the smart prison idea was to provide prisoners uh, access to digital services and also the so-called normal uh, society services, because these services cannot come inside prison, but it's very important that you keep contact with the services and, and get the help from them also. So our idea was that we bring uh, the device in the cell, directly in the cell, so, so that you have a personal device in the cell that you can use. Use a restricted access to internet and, and and the services there and also take care of your daily affairs in the uh, inside net inside the prison like contact staff uh, and reserve appointment uh, times and uh, purchase products uh, from the prison canteen and 
and then of course also use video calls with the relatives that have been very important during these times, <laughs> especially when, when we've had the restrictions that uh, relatives cannot come to prison because of the corona situation. So um, the idea was to provide a personal device for all these services and purposes for prisoners. And the first smart prison um, is uh, actually open, uh, opened yesterday in Hamenlinna, a women's prison. Oh, and uh, there we will, we are still a little bit uh, uh, progressing and testing the system, but uh, it should go live in the beginning of uh, next month, so that prisoners start to use the personal device in cells. So we are very, we are very close of completing the result for the first prison in Finland. Yeah. So so it's very much a like you know build a system, implement it, see if it works change things i mean it, it's interesting you sort of talk we, we're talking about you know the, the 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 big idea of giving someone a personal device the amount of personal devices that are smuggled into prisons anyway is it, quite significant right so it, it's almost removing that 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 want or that need to even be ha have sort of reinforcing criminal behaviors to, to try and have normal communications anyway right mm. Yeah, it, it's true that uh, they try to smuggle uh, their own devices and the smart devices nowadays, they are so small that it's uh, even more and more, um, it's easier all the time. And uh, we are trying to, uh, of course, uh, surveil the situation. And the smart device in cell, it's, it's actually going to be a kind of a laptop model oh. and the services are, are restricted. It's also for the studying purposes in prison that you can take the laptop with you to uh, prison school and study there. And there's a Moodle platform for completing the studies in the system. So uh, I think it's a good idea to provide some kind of a system, but for a very different purpose than the illegal devices that right. yeah, yeah, they yeah. try to bring into prison. Yeah. So, so when we've got this this whole new way of thinking, I mean, how much how much do you involve like the prisoners in the refinement of the system? You know, making the system better. You know, do, can, do you ask them to come up with good ideas about what they want, what services they need, and and how does that fit into uh, the work that you're putting together? When we planned this new women's prison, that is exactly what we did, that probably for the first time we uh, kind of systematically got feedback from prisoners during the planning phase of the new prison and its services. So we had workshops and we also had a test use for these uh, cell devices uh, last year. So in two prisons we tested. Uh, serve these kind of devices and got feedback from prisoners that uh, are they useful, are they easy to use, what kind of services they would like to have in the device, and so on and so on. So yes, that's what we are trying and trying to do, that we listen to our uh, customer feedback, so to say, yeah. and uh, and it's it's in the intentions of the criminal sanctions agency to do it even more in the future, so that it would be gathered systematically as any other records that we get from the prison system. There's a whole lot of uh, uh, data and research going around yeah. the information that we get from prisons and prisoners, and so. Mm so education and, and we've spoken about digitization and even artificial intelligence I, i've seen sort of uh, playing into this program can you just um give us a, a bit of an idea you know are, are you using ai as as a system within the system is it something that people learn um you know this this, this digital roadmap in a way you know um i mean how is that structured and how does that work we are very much in the beginning still, but uh, one thing that was easy to implement was uh, uh, a free, core, free online course on the basics of AI that we opened to all prisons uh, joint use workstations that have whitelisted internet. So we provided this course done by University of Helsinki and Reactor for prisoners. And there have been prisoners who have completed that. And uh, that's, that has been one course, uh, part of our strategy to teach uh, prisoners digital skills 
and prepare them for the future, for the future job markets and the skills needed there. And uh, in the future, the next project that I wish to work with is to bring this AI in our offender management a little bit more. And this is a project that um, uh, tries to use data in an automated way to orient uh, our clients to services that match their uh, certain criminogenic needs. So this is the kind of AI-oriented uh, offender management. So and this a, is very interesting. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's almost, uh, you know, we collect the data and then we it, it's almost a, a, a strategy per person um, curated yeah. by you know, through data um, and through machine learning, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, this this kind of systems have been under development in, in Finland for social services for some time. And we are trying to bring this model to uh, criminal sanctions too. I think there's a lot of possibilities as long as you take into account that automatic decision making is not the... Uh, the uh, most important idea behind it. It's not automatic decision making, but it's making, uh, it's about making a tool for the prison workers that helps them to analyze and help clients. That's, that's the idea. Yeah, I always talk about human and the machine when I when I talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, because, you know, there, there, there's one narrative is, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna sack all these people and all these jobs are going to be replaced, but that's not true. It's just now we can do more. So people that yeah. are, uh, people that work in the prison system can do more um, by having more of these tools that do some of that that hard work of you know customization of, of programs for, for people as well. So that's yeah. super interesting to me. I mean, what what's the goal in, in Finland? Is it is it? I know there's an active decarceration model. Is, is the goal to eventually have very few? prisons and all of the prisons as open as possible uh, yeah it's in a way to make our processes more efficient so that uh, prisoners get uh, the right service uh, as soon as possible faster because this is very important for the residism that you actually get the services that you really need and there's a continuum of services and uh, it's important to avoid wrong placements uh, to services because this usually frustrates a lot prisoners too that they, they that they have a sentence but nothing happens so so there's still uh, many things to make our uh, offender management more efficient and uh, get the prisoners needs match our services what we can provide so you, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. How do you how do you sort of link that you know the inside you know in in the in the prison so in in the open prison to the outside world? So I go through a program. I, I'm in the prison system. I go through the program and then I leave. I go back into the real world. How, yeah. how do you how do you consider bridging you know the program that you do in prison and bridging that into the real world? Yeah, this, this, uh, it has to be kept in mind that the process of release uh, starts from day one. So it must be all the time in your mind that to what I'm orienting and preparing this person for. And we have a lot of outside partners too and NGOs who, who are collaborating with us. So it's, it's a good thing that uh, some of the services inside prison come from outside and that there is outside agencies who come to prison to uh, give uh, rehabilitative uh, help. And, and this, is most, this, this is easier in open prison to arrange the continuum to civil yeah. services. Of course, we do it in closed prisons too. But it's about uh, also uh, showing prisoners uh, what is normal. We think uh, we talk about the so-called normality principle, so that uh, prisoners who should have the, the the kind of equal access to services and, and equal treatment, like if they were any other citizens in the society that definitely need help. So um, the, the the idea is uh, to. Uh, 
is to show an example to them, be example to them also as, as staff members that what is what is normal, what normal people do, how is normal society like, because uh, actually many of them uh, don't have such uh, such uh, such idea of what what the normal life is, if right. they have been uh, marginalized very early, like many have been, they are already so outside of the system that even the most uh, common things that are normal to us are kind of uh, new to them. This, this, is, this is interesting, but so it is. Yeah. So, so trying to bring everyone onto the same page around what, what even the basics of a normal life look, look like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's quite easy to sort of point at someone and say, oh, you're a criminal, you did this crime and you mm. need to go to jail for this amount of time. But their understanding of their you know, childhood trauma, their family relationships, where they've been living, if they've been homeless, you know, drug use yeah. or whatever, all of that is, it, it strips away what people would consider you know, normal in inverted commas, right? And, and put them outside of that system. So, so this is super interesting to me. So the smart prison system, the normality principle, bringing people together, the education, you know, reducing that recidivism, active decarceration, I mean, this is hugely progressive in the world, and that's why I, I sort of reached out to you, and uh, I really wanted to chat to you about this because it's uh, th this this is needed uh, in a lot of places around the world. I mean, have you been chatting? I mean, there's what 11 million people held in penal institutions around the world, and a lot of those people are in U.S., China, Brazil, Russia, and India. You know, very mm -hmm. highly populated places. I mean, have some of these countries sort of reached out to you or trying to partner with you? Have you, have you been sort of providing information and resources into those places we have uh, in europe uh, there there are already this kind of smart prisons in right. some countries but then there are a lot of countries who are just about to begin that this same process that we are now working on so yes i've i've been con contacted by some european countries and some from even farther away and uh, of course we have our international organizations Europris and and also ICPA International Corrections and Prisons Association so there's a lot of advanced uh, systems and uh, practices already in the world of course countries differ on the level of where the progress is going but definitely I can, I can see that uh, our strategy and aims uh, are not uh, totally unique. Uh, many Nordic countries are very uh, progressive in this way, like Norway, Sweden, Denmark. And then there are very good examples of smart prisons in Belgium, in UK. And uh, then, then uh, uh, the most advanced uh, systems uh, technologically, I think you can find in the, in the Far East, <laughs> like the Singapore prison system is, for example, very advanced. And so, um, uh, yes, there's a progress around the world. Mm. Yeah, so, and, and really the reduction of recidivism, the, you know, going back to prison again and again and again mm. is, is probably mm. one, of, one, one of the things to really disrupt, right? I mean, how, how do we do that? Because pe people in people that go to prison, they, they build friendships. And then when they leave prison, they can end up leaving friendships behind as well. I mean, do, mm. do, do you let past prisoners, you know, success stories from the open prison system sort of continue to uh, motivate people in, inside the system? We use uh, those kind of prisoners that have kind of been able to exit the criminal life right. <laughs> so we use them uh, in a way to be example to, to prisoners that this can happen to you too so these kind of testimonial uh, stories uh, okay. we can we can use to some extent to some extent like ex-convicts ex who have made the change in their life this is actually a development that is also very new in our system that we have just uh, during the past couple of years we have uh, seen the huge potential in this kind of peer support right uh, from ex-convicts but definitely i think if it's done in the right way it, it could work and uh, do you have any particular examples of of incredible success stories you know people that go from you know sort of the high risk offender profile into a low risk and then back out into uh 
you know, normal life inverted, uh, inverted commas, you know, it, are there, are there some people that you talk about as being sort of like, ah, look at this person, look how well mm. they've done. Mm. There are individual success stories that I've seen uh, as a prison psychologist. And then, then you also have to understand that not every story necessarily ends uh, in, in, in a kind of luxurious life after prison, but even to get a normal life after long history of being a, pri a prisoner and, uh, and living a criminal life is a success story. So if you truly get rid of drugs, that's already like a big success story in itself. So definitely there are, there are success stories and normal stories, but the normal stories are also success stories. Um, the, the ones that uh, uh, are kind of uh, at some point peacefully able to uh, desist from crime, as, as to say. And uh, of course, uh, we had um, this year, uh, Business Insider did a documentary about one uh, Finnish prisoner uh, who, who was in, in the open prison. And the document is about how he is now studying and seeing the future in a different way than, than before. This was one of, one of the uh, star <laughs> star cases <laughs> in in my career to see this particular case in the document so that, that's great and i'm gonna go and dig out that business insider uh sort of documentary as well i think that'll be definitely interesting for everyone to look at so i mean you're talking about you know how people see the future differently as prisoners but mm. you know how would you like to see the prison system you know in 2030 and beyond i mean what, what what's your vision for that future world I think uh, people, uh, I mean, prisons have become uh, more modern. Uh, and I don't only mean digitalization. I hope there are more smart prisons in Finland too. Uh, I hope uh, prisoners are rehabilitating and studying more uh, at that point. Uh, I, I hope that they have a more active uh, more active attitude <laughs> to, they take res the responsibility of their own rehabilitation during the prison time and and staff is truly supporting this kind of um, behavior and 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 i hope that um the path from uh, from a criminal life to normal life uh, has become more clear that it's possible to kind of uh, um, put the steps on this path and show that it's possible and enable it. And, and I hope uh, our staff becomes more enables, enablers <laughs> for prisoners uh, so that they can themselves uh, change their lives and, and take responsibility of their behavior. So I hope the system develops in, in this way I mean, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we've been we've been talking about the smart prison project. You talk about you know talking about the psychology of being a prisoner, how you get people back in into a sense of normality. I think the normality principle is incredibly uh, fascinating. But but really, you know, the, the, I mean, this conversation to me begs the question: you know, in the future, should there be any prisons at all? But we're going to find ourselves in this in in a world where people aren't going to stop undertaking crime i mean it's a it's a, mm. it's a human behavior for some people and 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 within yeah. certain systems you know sort of stealing food or whatever is is a means for survival so it can be it can yeah. be really really challenging right so um so uh pia i'd like to say thank you so much for your time today i'm gonna i'm gonna provide some links for the for the listeners of the podcast so they can go away they can read a little bit more about you a little bit more about the smart prison project um, what, I mean, what's happening? Uh, what, what, what do the next 12 months look like for the Smart Prison Project? So we will roll out uh, in the beginning of December. And then next year is going to be active year of uh, gathering experiences from the first Smart Prison in Finland. What kind of practices, experiences and feedback we get from it? What kind of services we can develop there? what are the services that prisoners start to use most and how this will change the prison culture 
because it's it's a very big change anyway, even though it's just about giving the device to the cell, but it will definitely change the whole culture too. And if we if we get good results, then I hope we will start to extend the model to all closed units in some pace. So maybe after about five years, I hope we have more than one smart prison in Finland. I, I hope we can see the value in this kind of solution and and bring it to other units too. That's awesome. And, you know, the disruption of culture is probably the most impactful thing that you can do. It's also the most difficult thing, thing to do as well and can can take a long time. But yeah. this, is, this, is a, this is a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, Finland's uh, Smart Prison Project. Pia Pulaka, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate mm -hmm. Thank that. You. We're, we're going to be watching what you're doing very closely. And uh, I think, you know, thinking about humans and that every single person, whether they're in a prison system or they're on the streets out there in the real world, you know, th they deserve equal attention and equal opportunities, right? And I think that, that that is what we need to remain open-minded towards. So, Pia, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs>